hospitality wise I'm not sure I think the positive will be people reassessing the way they appreciate their workplace the way they appreciate their job the way they might appreciate their employers or employees and appreciating their customers too you know, we, we all know we can't do anything without customers this is the deep in the weeds podcast I'm Anthony Huckstep During the series, we've heard from a few operators that have opened restaurants during the pandemic. But what of the big venues, like pubs? How have they, re- how have they remodeled their food offering to adapt and move forward, given the model they normally trade under require people en masse enjoying their custom? Julian Nikhil is the executive chef of Alala's in one of Australia's largest and most well-known pubs, the Oaks, in Neutral Bay. Julian, how are you going? Good, thanks. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. You're on the pans running a restaurant in the Oaks, which is legendary. It's a huge pub. Um, what, what's it like there at the moment? Well, it's, I mean, it's always a good place. It's always busy. There's always people wanting to come in. It's changed quite a bit in the year that I've been there. Um, we have restrictions now. Um you can only have 300 people in the whole venue, whereas previously on a Saturday night, you'd probably have about uh, 1,500 people in the whole place. So significantly, it's been cut down um, in that sense. And, and from that stems a lot of changes, I guess. You're uh, running a new restaurant, which opened during the pandemic. What was it like setting that up at that time? Yeah, well, we opened that in December, so just before it kind of hit. Then we, we ran that for a few months and then it was, you know, all the chitter chatter of this pandemic coming along and then it did and then and then the government announced a close down and, and, and that was that. So we had a good couple of maybe six months before it happened or even less. Uh, and then we, then it hit us and then everyone had to go home, basically. Um, had to move on a lot of staff. A lot of staff weren't qualified for the uh the job keeper they hadn't been with us for a year they were casual so you know a lot of guys didn't get any any payments out of the government or the workplace we couldn't apply for that for them um you know we had one australian guy who's worked in australia his whole life but because he came on as a casual he couldn't get the job keeper benefit and we also had you know an indonesian guy who had to go back home because he had no income in sydney he tried to book a flight home and that flight got cancelled so he had to stay around another month and then he finally got home and with, with no money and, and, and yeah, lots of, lots of stories of people like that who have missed out big time. We've talked to many restaurateurs and chefs during the series about the impact on their restaurants, but the Oaks is huge, as you say, you can have up to 1,500 people in it. What sort of impact has that had not being able to have the numbers that they normally have through the venue? Well, I mean, the biggest way to cut costs in a, in a venue is, is staff, really, so if you've gone from having uh if you've gone to 25% of your takings then you might need to cut your staff by 75% essentially so you know your incomings are relative to your outgoings and then you have to go from there um we at Alala's we were open 7 days lunch and dinner we've come back and we've we're back to um 4 days now that's it we're running the kitchen with uh, three chefs only over four days where previously we had probably 10 chefs running the place over seven days. Um, one, cause we have more foot traffic on a daily basis and we would have more opening hours. And it's, it's, so you compare it to that and you lose bar staff, kitchen staff, you know, all the floor staff, everything's been cut big time. What sort of impact has that had on the, on what you're delivering from the kitchen? Is it a very different offering to what you envisaged when you first opened? Um, when we first came back, we decided to do a, a set menu. We were doing two or three courses because that would uh, firstly generate a, a higher spend per head, which means it would be more sustainable for us to be open so people not coming in and buying a bowl of chips for $10, if you may, or coming at least spending uh, you know, um, $45 on two courses and getting an entree and a main instead of a $30 main, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we had to move into that. Then that kind of, I think it wore out its course. We were also taking prepayments for bookings. And the, the problem with prepayments on a customer's perspective is that no one wants to lay down the money before they've been there. 
the but for us to do something like that we wanted to make sure people were going to come so we weren't missing out on other bookings if we're full and so yeah you're playing a game a gambling game of that that kind of ran its course we started to get slower again after a few months so we got rid of the two or three courses and the pre-payments um and then we reopened with an a la carte menu um we we can still only have 50 people in our section in the pub of the oaks that's our capacity and a la carte's doing okay um we're getting pretty full now in december um yeah that's a big change definitely you uh, spent a lot of time with uh, Mike McInerney in Kitchen by Mike, um, but you, le- you left that group just before the pandemic. Can you, can you tell us about that period of time and um, what you were looking after? Um, so I worked at the, I started at the original Kitchen by Mike in Rosebury. Um, I went over there with Jeff DeRome, who was the head chef for Mike then. And he took me over to meet Mike. I met Mike and we opened this amazing place in Rosebury and I was there for three and a half years from from a chef to party up to a sous chef to basically a head chef um I went through the whole journey of the three and a half years there from opening to close and it was probably one of the greatest times in my career to be honest I learned so much from Mike and Jeff and in in how to cook properly how to cook simply how to respect ingredients how to um, run a kitchen how to cost things how to reduce wastage all these beautiful things that I now kind of live by now and want to keep progressing on um, that that went yeah, gangbusters it was amazing such a good time I, if that was still open I might still be there today to be honest um, and then that kind of closed down did its thing then I went overseas to Canada for a while went and snowboarded and cooked in a, in a restaurant at night time and then Mike asked me to come back and be the head chef of the um, kitchen of Mike at the International Airport in Sydney. So I said, yep, definitely. Came back and did that for a good good year or so. Um, and that was, again, a whole new kind of concept in an airport. It had its challenges in itself, but it was such a great time too. So yeah, I've, I was with Mike for about five years in total, definitely. And I still regard him as a, as a friend and a leader and, a, and a, I look up to him all the time still to this day. Airports have changed perhaps forever and international travel is still in in doubt um, with so many countries still dealing uh, with the pandemic. What Can you tell us what it takes to run a venue, a restaurant, a food service offering in, a, in an airport? It's such a different proposition to a standalone bricks and mortar in society. Oh, totally. It's... Um... All the issues you have in a restaurant, plus another 10 of them on top of that, like the logistics of security, um, getting security passes for your staff, um, obtaining your produce. So it gets delivered downstairs to our storm and he puts it away. Then you need to write a list for it to then to be to come up into the airport, into the quarantine zone of the airport where it has to go and get x-rayed. So every jar, every loaf of bread has to get x-rayed taken off the trolley back onto the trolley you know and then there has to be wheeled into the into the through the airport into our little kitchen we have then a little fridge that we need to move stock up and down maybe two or three times a day because there's you're moving a lot of stock but you don't have the room inside the airport all the, all the storage is downstairs so you've got the logistics of that um, and then you've got a customer base which is which can be quite unique too you don't necessarily have the regular people that will come once a week, twice a week, twice a day even that you would have in a, in a normal place, whereas you've got people that are only there when they're traveling. So you've got people that um, get it, get what Kitchen My Mike was about, and then you've got a lot of people that don't get it. Why am I paying this for this? Why Why does it come like this? Blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing for people to open up their mind or not open up their mind, you know what I mean? There's plenty of that going on there. Challenging for sure. Well, you've listed uh, like quite a few challenges with uh, Kitchen by Mike at Sydney Airport, but it won some big international awards for best food in an airport. What, what was special about what you did there? Well, I think it was unique and totally different to what I had seen anyone do, at least in Australia and, and the international airports that I'd travelled to. Um, Kitchen by Mike itself was unique. Then for that to go into an airport was even more unique, you know, you, Everyone goes to the airport and thinks they're going to get McDonald's and, and that's that. Um, we were trying to do the best, the freshest food possible. And I think that's something no one's ever, no one's used to and use 
local ingredients in Sydney that we'd used all the time anyway and highlight you know, local producers and, and, and all those guys. Um, that's something that was maybe foreign to a lot of people in an airport. But when you had the positivity of people saying, oh, that was such a great thing to to see and to eat and I'll be back here again, that makes it all worthwhile, all the challenges definitely. You mentioned that all the produce coming in had to be x-rayed and all the security involved. You know, what With sort of bigger fast food sort of outlets there, what was it like trying to get your produce through dealing with those sort of, you know, the likes of McDonald's and that have such high volume? Oh, I remember, I remember speaking to the storm and then saying, where's our, like, we need food in the kitchen. We're running out. We need to start getting some more food into our kitchen from downstairs. And he's like, I'm stuck behind McDonald's in the, in the queue for the x-ray. <laughs> so, you know, McDonald's have got three or four trolleys. It takes him two hours to wow. take it all off, unload it, get it through the x-ray. And he's stuck behind it. And I'm going, mate, someone wants to buy some chicken. Can, can I get my chickens up here? I asked for two hours ago. <laughs> um, so you had to be really on top of it. You had to be a few hours ahead of the game and predict how much you were going to move. And <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing, very funny thing. You mentioned during that time you learnt how to cook properly and how to cook simply. What do you what do you mean by that? Can you take us through some dishes that sort of exemplify that theory of cooking? Yeah, I mean, I think Mike was all about championing produce, and you know, to take like to take a pumpkin, cut it into a, a chunk and, and just roast the pumpkin with salt and oil and caramelize it properly and then put a little bit of dressing on top and some leaves. That was, you know, a dish. And that's something that like that I think a lot of people are missing the boat on, you know, how do I do something? How do I buy something from market and take it home and make it good? Like just cook it well and just cook it to its maximum and don't piss around with it. You know what I mean? You can, um, I try to do it to this day. What's the one ingredient I want to highlight on the plate and what can I complement that one ingredient with? And that's the dish. Do you know what I mean? Take, give, me, give us a piece of eggplant, marinate it well, cook it well and serve with a couple of little uh, things that will complement it and accompany it and you've got three or four things on a plate that's absolutely delicious and then and why do you need to go past that? Um, I think Mike gave me a book one day called The Art of Simple Cooking by Alice Waters and it and it was yeah it kind of summarized what was going on there um in in what he was doing with these things you know we would roast the chicken with oil and salt and some herbs rubbed over it and that was it but cook the chicken properly take it to the right cook then cut it up nicely and serve it with a sauce and some and some broccolini you know that's that where do you, you don't need to take the skin off and, and roll it and wrap it and balancing it and stuff it and all these things, you don't really need to as long as you've got a good product to start with and you still can see that good product at the end. I think that's most important. Can you take us back to when you were a lot younger and first got interested in food? What, what led you to a career in hospitality? Well, I left school when I was 18. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't want to go study again because I wasn't loving school and I didn't want to... Sp- Put down another four years of study so decided to go traveling um made a mind went on a we saved up some money i worked in a pizza shop so i was kind of you know it was fun i enjoyed the fast paced thing of that but then went to london um i did my kentucky tour went to london ended up in a kitchen to get it to get a job and then i worked in the kitchen with these with these guys and i started enjoying the buzz of it we were doing event catering for um lots of events high-end events around london and, the, and the, around the UK, we, we do stuff in the Tate Modern, um, the Royal History Museum, all these places. We would do like Mac- McLaren, Mercedes staff parties and Hamilton would fly in his helicopter for the party and all these things. Um, that opened up my eyes and, the, and they decided to put me through chef school there. So I went to chef school once a week um, and then the other three weeks I was working for them. Um, my head chef was Australian, so we got along really well. He's was from Tasmania. And uh, I'm good mates with him to this day and I learned heaps there and ended up being there for four years and got my qualification and then came back to Australia with it. Beautiful. So it wasn't, I guess, a, a decision. I kind of fell into it and by using my brain and using my hands, that's when I know I like something instead of deciding on a piece of paper I'm going to like something, I feel. Uh, so you left the Kitchen by Mike group to open Alala's. Can you tell us about the menu there and the food that you're offering? Yeah, sure. I mean, we are pretty much, it's influenced a lot by the Kitchen by Mike days. It's influenced a lot by 
uh, my travels through Europe, um, North America, Northern Africa, a bit of Asia, and I'm just cooking things that I really enjoy to cook and would enjoy to eat and hoping that uh, resonates with, with customers too. Trying to tap into um, indigenous ingredients, um, trying to use the best producers we can around Australia, um, trying to make sure you know people come in and they can have a bite or they can have a couple of courses or they can have a three course meal. Um, I just want people to understand like simple food, it can be done well too. I'm talking about ham on croquettes that I ate in a bar in Spain um, and people are blown away by how good they are here and for me it's just a it's a standard it's a staple Spanish snack that I had overseas and just replicating that in Australia and people's minds are blown but it's a it's a simple humble thing in Spain so it's kind of cool to trick them into thinking it's something like so beautiful and so incredible but it's actually pretty boring if you're Spanish to be honest um yeah we, we're just trying to do a, a humble um humble and refined pub food as such we don't want it to be we don't want it to be fine dining and we don't want it to be pub food we want it to be sit right in the middle and be casual and approachable like that and affordable too how do you see gastro pubs in australia they've changed a lot in the last decade um what sort of challenges are involved in creating the menu for that market yeah i think the market is from what i've seen and uh, it's quite challenging. People don't always understand it, what you're trying to do. I mean, being at the Oaks for a year, people still go to the Oaks and they want their, their steak and they want their schnitzel and they want their burger. We have, you know, older ladies coming in and, and dressed up to the nines. It looks like they've got money. I'm sure they do. And, and all they want is a schooner and a burger. It's, it's quite incredible. Whereas we're offering something, you know, a nice bit of fish or a, a nice beautiful piece of pumpkin or whatever. Um, some scallops on the shell roasted in the oven simply and and it's still kind of a bit too far out for them i find it quite quite funny like the world knows food better now now in the last 10 years than it's ever done but there's still kind of the sim the under simplicity of 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 the concept there so we have found it challenging being next to the oaks as everyone knows it and having that traditional pub food and what they do is awesome and great and that has its own place and i'm I'm also inclined to go out and eat a burger on my day off too. I don't need anything fancy, but yeah, trying to tap into a, a market that's trying to gastro pub it up. I guess that word is not very much used in Australia too. It's a, a very English word. I think the concept of gastro pub in, in England is uh, a lot a lot better used than it is in Australia. Pubs have been heavily impacted by restrictions because of the pandemic. How do you, how do you see those sort of larger venues and big events and um, mass gatherings as we move forward. Do you think the model will change with pubs? Well, I don't know. I hope so. I mean, we even thought about that before we were open, you know, we're talking about how do you present a menu to someone now? Do people share a menu on the table? Do they have to come up and order? Do we not have any waiters coming to the table now to reduce the the contact? Um, I don't know, I, I could go one of either way. I think it can go back to kind of normal and everyone's just relaxed. And I kind of think it's going to go back that way when we're all over this pandemic, however way that may be. Or it's going to, we're going to have these restrictions of, I think, you know, things like signing in before you go into a venue is going to stay for a long time, I imagine. Um, I think little changes, but I, I think we will go back to what we're used to. That's not always a good thing because I think sometimes the world may need a good reset and to think about things in a, in a better perspective. And I hope we do get a lot out of this period. But um, in saying that, I'd, yeah, it can go either way, really. Mike McInerney obviously passed on a lot of knowledge to you. What do you like to pass on to your team to try and get the best out of them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I enjoy, I do enjoy teaching people. I feel it's, it's humbling for me to like to, have taken from other people and then and then give it back but i'm still looking up to other people to take from them as well um but yeah, I, I enjoy teaching them not just how to cook but how to uh, how to think about what they're doing each day how to move how to plan their day ahead and and how to how to taste things i think tasting things is one thing that gets lost a little bit with a lot of people tasting things at each step of the way at the start tasting the raw ingredient tasting it at the start of the cooking process, at the end, and at the end again, and, and all these things. I think that's lost quite a bit um, in a lot of people. 
um, I think I get a kick out of, you know, having a good team of guys around you, guys and girls, and, and everyone being on the same page and moving forward and pushing each other to, to get the most out of each other on a daily basis and striving for the for the best that you guys, that we can all achieve, I guess. I think I enjoy, yeah, having a team that's that's happy, you know, and I think I get happiness from, from being driven by myself and by my boss and, and driving other people. And if they can drive themselves and achieve uh, and accomplish their challenges, I think everyone's going to be happy. So I, I try to let them, give them a challenge, but then definitely applaud them when they um, when they've passed that challenge and then bang, on to the next one. <laughs> you mentioned how important great produce is and um, knowing how to cook it properly and cook it simply. You've always had a strong relationship with producers and now you're beginning to do some producer events in a pub environment what what events have you got coming up and and in the in the future yeah definitely we've wanted to do them for a while but obviously the first year was a bit of a write-off in doing that um we just did a scarborough wine dinner a couple of weeks ago that was our first kind of event since we can have 50 people in the venue um next week we're doing a gin and caviar dinner um which is four pillars gin with the uh, Yarra Valley caviar. So I've written a little kind of menu of bites. There's probably like eight different um, tasters on there with with matching gin and matching caviar on there. So yeah, trying to tap into something else to get more people uh, understanding alalas, to highlight produce, to get to, to just to do something different and exciting. And, and these events have been selling out pretty quickly. We're working on another wine dinner coming up in uh, January. So I think every month we're going to try and do a new dinner, whether it be highlighting drinks, highlighting produce, um, cooking something I want to cook, you know, and, and challenging ourselves to get a new ingredient, get a new wine and, and match that and, and and do something new and different and exciting because no one wants to be stagnant really. So it's exciting for us, definitely. We talked about Kitchen by Mike at the airport. What has the impact been of the pandemic on your former sort of chefs and, and colleagues from that group? Yeah, well, I mean, basically they've all lost that job and have no idea when they'll be going back to the job if any time soon at all. The, the international airport is, is pretty much closed and it was a it was a venue that needed a high turnover of customers too. So um, my old chefs that I was still there, my old sous chef who became the head chef, you know, basically lost his job straight away um, and, and all the other front of house team and all the other chefs were, were done. So... They, they, um, that was set up by Emirates Leisure Retail, who are a Dubai-based company. So they could not apply for the JobKeeper being it wasn't actually an Australian company. So they all went on the, the job seeker, the ones that did and could, and then were, were basically looking for jobs. Um, I think they're all mostly okay now working in jobs, but it's not, some of them probably not in their ideal situation where they want to be career-wise moving forward, but they've had to take the work that they can now um, so yeah, I mean, if I was there, that would have been me. I would have lost my job too. Um, I feel sad and sorry. I also feel humbled and, and appreciative that I still do have a job. I could be sit at home for three months on the job keeper, whereas they didn't have that um, option, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's it's terrible. I feel sad for them. I feel, feel sad for Mike. Um, yeah, and, and everyone else involved. And even the producers and the suppliers, you know, took a big cut, things like that. Um, yeah, it's terrible. There's been so many establishments that have um, lost workers and um, closed during this time, and even you've had to let go of staff. What sort of impact do you think all of this will have on the hospitality industry? I think a lot of people have had to step back and reassess how they function their business. Um, again, with like costs of staff and costs of produce, and and the, even like their business model. Um, I've seen guys like my friends at Cherry Moon, who I worked with for a little bit, Kim. She's had to kind of alter her um, place and, and stop doing the table service and just run it as a as a bakery takeaway or quick sit down place instead of doing the table service because they couldn't do it because of the size of the place. But they and, and they stopped doing that. Then they realised that um, during those restrictions that it was actually better off for the business to do that. So in that they had to lose staff. But in that, they've figured that there's a better business model there, definitely. So I think a lot of people would be approaching it in that way. Even even we have, you know, our menu is a lot smaller than what it used to be. And by having a smaller menu, you can be 
uh, a bit more efficient with with your labor but in having a smaller menu some customers will be will complain is that it is that the menu is that all you have well yeah it is but i've been here for 12 hours trying to get this menu done me and my two other guys you know so yeah there's a it's definitely people have changed their perspective of things and they will more so going forward i hope how are you feeling is it has it changed your perspective on the way that you work as a chef and and live your life um hospitality has always been a, a tough thing even before the pandemic just to keep the kitchen flowing keep stuff happy keep a sustainable business um i feel like okay. i feel like I've, I've actually gained a lot of, a bit out of it a lot or a bit um trying to decide which one but i guess the i had three months off and i was home for three months and and i got a lot done then i quite enjoyed my three months off because that doesn't happen very often as terrible as it was for other people, it wasn't as bad for me. And I sat at home and I read books and I cooked things I hadn't cooked before. I did guitar lessons online. I was reading just, just and, I, and I was running actually, getting fit. I never felt any healthier in my life, which is a shame because you feel less healthier going to work. But um, I feel I, I gained a lot out of that personally, but I know other people um, might have definitely been caught in a trap of you know waking up and putting on the TV and, and sitting there all day and not having money coming and not having any money in the bank. And I, uh, I'm, I'm respectful of that for other people too, but always just trying to turn a negative into a positive. Um, that's my perspective, I guess. So people could have seen that as a negative and I've lost income and all these things, but I just tried to humble myself and make it uh, better for myself in that sense. Yeah, so I feel good. It's been tough having to let go of my staff. I try to stay in contact with them, see if they're okay, trying to help them out with jobs even now to this day if someone's available for a job, blah, blah, blah. Um, and some have gone back to overseas and, and, and all that. But no, I'm, I feel okay, but I feel sorry for a lot of other people, but trying to keep a positive spin on everything most definitely. Well, the end of end of the year is fast approaching and, uh, and it's warming up too and restrictions are easing more and more. Um, how are you going to um, look back at this year as we move into 2021? Well, I think everyone's going to remember this year big time and I hope I hope next year is going to be better for not just like Australia but, you know, the USA's and the, and the UK's and the Europe that are struggling at the moment and everywhere else. But uh, I'm hoping this is the worst year we're going to have. Um, I don't know, I look back on it as a reflective time. I'm 35 years old this year and... I think it's a significant year in everyone's life, really. We'll remember it. I, I, I feel like I remember it positively because I took positive things out of it, definitely. But it still looks back as a daunting year for the rest of the world, and I'll, I'm humbled by that too. I guess I'm appreciative of um, having my health and having my life and freedom as such comparative to others. So I'll take what I can from that. Yeah, there you go. You, you mentioned that you're taking positives out of the ex- experience. What, what are some of those and... Can they be adapted to make change in hospitality? Um, I think just respecting uh, respecting people around you, respecting you know being grateful for one. I'm, I'm I get paid and I have a job, and and that's a positive for me. Positively, people staying at home or we're, we're contacting their friends overseas or interstate or around the around the country, and um, you know people connected a bit more. I was doing bloody trivia nights with like groups of friends every week or something like that, you know, which we never would have done previously on a Sunday night on Zoom. Um, uh, uh, Hospitality wise, I'm not sure. I think the positive will be people reassessing their, their, the way they appreciate their workplace, the way they appreciate their job, the way they might appreciate their employers or employees um, and appreciating their customers too. You know, we, we all know we can't do anything without customers. Um, customers need to give back to us as well in, in saying that. But, yeah, it's a reflective time. I don't know if I have a real answer for that, to be honest. I'll have to think about that one. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the challenges of doing a gastro pub in Australia, even though they've changed so much in the last decade. Um, what would you like to see happen over the next year or two with pub dining and, and, and consumers in pubs as well? that are dining? Um, I think people need to have just a more of a uh, open mind about things, you know. I guess 
yeah, we want to go to a pub and have a steak and a schnitzel and a burger, but there's more to the world out there. You could do a a, a different steak. You could do a, 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 you know, we're doing a Chateaubriand, which is a special, or we're doing a, a smoked flat iron steak. It's not a ribeye, it's not a sirloin, you know, it's just a little bit left of center of the traditional thing you may be getting. We just did a... I never wanted to do a Parmigiana, but we just did one um, to raise funds for Ronald McDonald House Charities and $5 for each Parmi was going to them. But we did it with three cheeses and a bush tomato sauce um, and an oregano potato vinaigrette. So it's just a little bit left of center. And I know there'll be people out there that would be thinking, oh, that's a bit uh, wank or a bit you know different or a bit like weird. But if uh, if that wasn't the tastiest Parmi you've had, then then I'm not a chef. To be honest, um, see, so yeah, I think just people need to be a bit more open-minded. I guess a lot of the time, you, you know, you might run out of, say, some barramundi, and and someone will be like, "Well, what are you going to give me then? Why are you why why don't you have it?" And you know, people need to understand that there's a, there's a whole chain of people that it came from and a whole system. And just because you don't have your barramundi today, you know, get over it. Get something else. Be a bit more open-minded. Try something new and different. Um, I think the world will be a better place and a bit more humble if, if that was happening. And definitely pub meals, have, pub meals have definitely gone up in standards for sure. They have, um, but keep progressing, just keep moving, keep trying to give people new things to, to try and eat and try something new off the menu one day, you know? <laughs> well, Julian, um, hats off to you trying to push the envelope with uh, pub dining in Australia. Hopefully you, you've got a full shop uh, this summer and moving into 2021. Uh, loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today. Please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much, guys. All the best. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.